Good evening, and welcome to tonight's MTA Town Hall about the Interborough Express. I'm Sean Fitzpatrick, Deputy Chief of Staff at MTA Construction and Development. The Interborough Express, or IBX, is a proposed transit project that will, would connect Brooklyn and Queens using an underutilized freight rail line that runs from Bay Ridge to Jackson Heights. This past January, Governor Hochul directed the MTA to start on the next steps for this project, making it a reality. Since that announcement, the MTA has been busy starting that process with stakeholder engagement and additional engineering analysis. Tonight's virtual town hall will begin with remarks from Jamie Torres Springer, president of MTA Construction and Development, about the opportunity that the IBX creates for New Yorkers. Then we'll present a short video to introduce the project, followed by a presentation from Mike Schiffer, senior vice president of MTA Regional Planning, to describe the project in more detail. Following the presentation, we'll answer your questions. To ask a question, use the Q&A function on the Zoom app, and it will be added to the list. We've also received a number of questions in advance. We won't be able to get to every question tonight, but we'll get to as many as we can and touch on the major themes. We'll also be updating the project's website with a frequently asked questions page to have even more information following this meeting. That website is new.mta.info slash ibx. That's new.npa.info slash ibx. We'll put that information into the Q&A chat as well. This meeting comes at the very beginning of this process, and we are very grateful that you're with us tonight and look forward to it being the first of many conversations in the weeks, months, and years to come. With that, let me introduce Jamie Torres Springer, President of MTA Construction and Development. Thank you very much, Sean. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm glad to have a chance to emphasize how much of an opportunity Interborough Express presents for New Yorkers. Governor Hochul charged the MTA a few months back with getting this project moving because she recognizes the transformative impact it can have on New Yorkers from all walks of life. And I really mean all walks of life would benefit from shorter trip times and better connections it would run through more than a dozen community boards in Brooklyn and Queens, including some of the most diverse and vibrant neighborhoods in the world. By connecting Brooklyn and Queens directly, the IBX, as we're calling it, meets the real needs of our riders in those boroughs. There's more to public transit than getting people to and from Manhattan. Among people who live within a half mile of the IBX, 60% of workers commute within Brooklyn and Queens, not to Manhattan. So there are huge benefits for them to have access between Brooklyn and Queens enhanced. And there's more to transit, of course, in getting people to and from work. The IBX would connect students to schools. It would help friends and family reach one another. It would give all New Yorkers better access to the neighborhoods along the corridor. As the head of MTA's Construction and Development Agency, how the project would accomplish this is also uh, very exciting to me. It takes advantage of an existing right-of-way, the underused freight lines running from Bay Ridge to Jackson Heights. Even if you live in these neighborhoods, you might not know it's there. And yet, this little-used railway has incredible potential. By using existing infrastructure, it allows us to advance the project more quickly, at lower cost, and with less disruption to nearby residents and the community at large. It's still very early days for this project. We've conducted a feasibility study, as Sean mentioned, but we haven't yet determined what type of transportation mode makes the most sense, as you'll hear from Mike during his presentation in a few minutes. We haven't conducted a full environmental review, and we haven't secured funding for the project. But I'm glad that the public is already getting involved. Community participation will be vital as we advance the IBX. Thank you for joining us, and thank you for staying engaged tonight and beyond. Back to you, Sean. Thank you, Jamie. To set the stage, we'll now show a brief introductory video with more details about the project. When the New York City subways were built, they were primarily designed to bring people into and out of Manhattan. The subway connected densely populated Manhattan to the outer boroughs, which helped fuel their growth within the newly consolidated New York City. When the subway opened, Manhattan's population was bigger than Brooklyn and Queens combined. Today, Brooklyn and Queens residents outnumber Manhattanites three to one. 
Manhattan is still the center of New York City, but the incredible growth of Brooklyn and Queens, as well as the Bronx and Staten Island, means that travel within the city often doesn't involve Manhattan. Take traveling from Brooklyn to Queens. Unless you live near the G train or can connect to it, if you want to take the subway, you typically need to detour through Manhattan. That adds extra time to your trip and more crowding on trains in the busiest part of the system. There has to be a better way, and there is. The Interborough Express is an idea for a new 14-mile transit service between Bay Ridge, Brooklyn, and Jackson Heights, Queens. The IBX would bring passenger service back to the Bay Ridge branch, an underused freight rail corridor that is only used by a few freight trains per day. This line hasn't carried passenger trains since 1924. The Interborough Express would connect 20 neighborhoods with up to 17 subway lines and the Long Island Railroad, providing a fast, direct, and affordable connection between Queens and Brooklyn. End-to-end -end trip times on IBX would take between 39 and 45 minutes. A subway trip that takes almost an hour today could take only 20 minutes on the IBX, or a route that requires four different subways could instead take just 30 minutes with no transfers. And neighborhoods far from the subway altogether would have new connections to all of New York City. Over 900,000 people live within a half mile of the IBX route and some of the fastest growing neighborhoods in the city. Most commuting trips in these neighborhoods don't start or end in Manhattan, but within Brooklyn and Queens. The MTA studied a number of different possible modes of transportation for the IBX and found that three were feasible, conventional rail, light rail transit, and bus rapid transit. Conventional rail would feature two dedicated passenger rail tracks running alongside the existing freight line. Train cars would be similar to those used on Long Island Railroad and Metro North, but with more doors for faster boarding and more standing room, like you'd find on subway cars. Conventional rail would run below street level at subway-like frequencies. Its average runtime would be about 45 minutes end to end, and it would serve a projected 85,000 weekday riders. Light rail transit would use a two-track line running either above or alongside the existing freight tracks. Smaller than subway cars, light rail uses trams that can operate on dedicated tracks and the street. Light rail has the highest projected ridership of the three options at about 88,000 per weekday and would have the shortest runtime at 39 minutes. Bus rapid transit uses buses on a dedicated bus only road, separate from traffic except at crossings, that would run alongside or above freight rail lines. Bus rapid transit has the lowest projected ridership at about 74,000 people per weekday and would have a lower passenger capacity than other options, but it would be the most flexible, allowing other bus routes to use parts of the corridor. All three options feature electric vehicles and modern technology to make them cleaner, quieter, and less disruptive, and all three options would contribute to job, recreational, and economic growth to the surrounding communities. So what's next? The MTA is still in the early phases of the project and is beginning the environmental review process. If the MTA moves forward with IBX, station locations will need to be identified. After that, the plan will undergo further design and then construction. But we can't do this without you. We'll need your feedback throughout the process. What do you think about the IBX? You can let us know in the comments or keep in touch by visiting the IBX website. Thank you to the entire team that put that excellent video together. Now allow me to introduce Mike Schiffer, Senior Vice President for MTA Regional Planning here at MTA Construction and Development. Mike has extensive experience in transportation planning, both in practice and in academia, all across North America, and has been leading the planning process for the Interborough Express. Mike will give a presentation, and then he'll answer your questions. As a reminder, if you'd like to submit a question, please enter it into the Q&A box in the Zoom app. Now, I'll turn it over to Mike. Thank you, Sean. It's a thrill for me to present this to you. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the Interborough Express Corridor. I'm going to tell you what we've learned from the feasibility so far, and I'm going to describe the path forward. So um, in terms of the context, first of all, it's, it's worth noting that the Interborough Express Corridor is a 14-mile freight line that uh, extends from Bay Ridge, Brooklyn, up to Jackson Heights, Queens. We're studying the feasibility of building a new transit line uh, along this corridor, as you just heard from the video, and the study results are going to feed into a subsequent environmental review uh, and other project stages as we move forward. Uh, it's important to note that uh, the corridor itself is used for freight movements in the study, and any transit line would preserve the ability uh, to continue freight operations along the corridor. 
So here you can see a couple of images of the same platform, but these images were taken almost 100 years apart. Uh, they're basically at East New York Station, and that platform still exists just outside of the East New York Tunnel. Really, it's worth noting that passenger service uh, began in 1876 uh, along this line as part of the New York and Manhattan Beach Railway. Uh, passenger service ceased in 1924, and currently it's one of the few freight lines that serves this area of the region and Long Island. The northern portion of the line, uh, the northern three miles, uh, primarily in Queens, uh, is owned by CSX, and the southern portion, primarily in Brooklyn, uh, of 11 miles, is owned by Long Island Railroad and operated uh, by the New York and Atlantic Railway. Currently, there's up to three freight trains operating on the line a day, and many of those trains operate at night, so uh, actually a lot of people don't even notice that they're there, uh, typically if you're driving past or walking past or taking a train uh, along the line. Um, the, it's worth noting that while Manhattan will always be an important destination, more commuters travel between and within the boroughs these days. Yet the subway network, as was noted in the video, is predominantly oriented for trips to and from Manhattan. About half of the trips uh, between Brooklyn and, and Queens, or, or for Brooklyn and Queens, uh, commutes are by automobile. It's also a very diverse study area. Demographically speaking, uh, the study area, which is defined as a half mile on each side of the line, um, has almost a million people living there and almost a quarter million, more than a quarter million jobs. Uh, the corridor's non-white population is about 70%, and nearly half of the residents in the corridor don't own a car either by choice or by necessity. So it's a, a very rich, vibrant uh, area that, that's quite reflective of New York as a whole. Um, from a physical standpoint, the corridor itself is also diverse. Some portions of the corridor are elevated, uh, some are in a tunnel, uh, others are below street level. Uh, so from an engineering and planning perspective, you have quite a few different constraints and operating environments that you have to think about as you're planning uh, passenger transportation while maintaining freight operations along the corridor. So now I'm going to describe where we're at uh, with the feasibility study uh, that's been underway. Really, the feasibility study started, uh, is guided by, by six key needs. Uh, the first was supporting the economic health of the communities along the line. The second is connecting our subway lines, both within each, uh, with each other, as well as connecting the communities in between the subway lines to the subway itself, so people could have greater access uh, to uh, the overall transportation network for better options uh, to travel. Um, it also provides improved connections. The, the objective is to provide improved connections uh, to job opportunities uh, along the corridor and, and throughout the region. And it leverages an existing right-of-way. And the reason why that's so important is because we live in a highly developed and built-up region, and it's really hard to find straight or curved lines that you can run trains along these days. And, and so we want to leverage uh, these kinds of rights-of-way to their highest and best use where possible. We recognize the need uh, to, to preserve current and future freight movement uh, along the line, particularly for the economic health of the region. And by doing this, we can reduce truck and car congestion. The study considered a broad range of transit modes and configurations. Uh, through the initial analysis uh, regarding necessary carrying capacity, required separation from freight operations, and resultant space requirements, our broad range of, of options, such as subway, automated guideway transit, conventional rail, light rail, and bus rapid transit, they were narrowed down uh, to the three uh, that we're going to describe today. Um, and those three uh, we're going to focus on telling you a little bit about how they might fit uh, within the study area. So uh, the three alternatives that we're considering for transit technologies along the corridor are all electric powered. Uh, the conventional rail, the light rail, and the bus rapid transit would be electrically powered. Um, and I'm going to describe each of these. So 
Conventional rail is very similar to the trains you would see on Long Island Railroad or Metro North. The chief difference is that uh, these electric trains uh, would operate more frequently with lots of stops, kind of like a subway line. So therefore, the cars themselves would be configured with more doors and fewer seats, typically, to accommodate the short trips people would take. We expect the trains along this line to operate as frequently as every five minutes, every five to ten minutes, kind of like many subway lines do. Uh, and we expect that people wouldn't necessarily ride end to end on the line. They would, they would join the line at various intermediate stops the way most people use the subway. So we expect that the trips along the line would be rather short. There's examples of conventional rail operation in, in other places. And if you take a look at, at the, the middle image there, that's the London Overground. That's an example of where they've taken a, a conventional rail line and they've converted it more to a rapid transit-like operation. There's also some interior images of London Overground on the left and the Hong Kong MTR on the right. And that's one of our very own Long Island Railroad M9s in the upper right corner. Here's an example. Um, of uh, one of our one of our trains, basically on the Port Washington branch, and, and this is uh, the Bayside Station, uh, and it just gives you an example of the kind of operating environment that you might see uh, along the Interborough Express. The second, uh, oh, and then it's also worth noting that the stations uh, for commuter rail would be separated from the street level. They would either be below or above the street. Uh, and they would be directly adjacent to the existing freight alignment. The second um, rail mode that we're going to talk about this evening is light rail. Light rail has become very popular around the world. You don't have to go very far to experience it. A simple trip to Hoboken uh, allows you to take a ride on the Hudson Bergen light rail line. There's other examples of light rail in cities throughout the world in North America. For example, Toronto operates long articulated streetcars like the one you see in the upper right. Uh, and in the lower right, you see an example from the LA Metro. These trains are very flexible, uh, both the physically they're flexible, but they're also flexible operationally. Uh, they're designed to operate safely in mixed traffic uh, or at higher speeds on their own right of way. Uh, here's a couple of examples uh, that you can see. Um, there's Toronto, and then here's an example uh, from New Jersey Transit. So the stations for light rail would typically be at street level, separate from the existing freight alignment. Regulations require a certain degree of physical separation from freight trains for light rail and for bus rapid transit. That's a greater separation than you would have for conventional trains. Um, so the, the light rail in this case is operating above the freight line, uh, and the stations would be integrated to serve the surrounding neighborhood. Finally, bus rapid transit is different from the select bus service that you may, may be familiar with um, in that bus rapid transit vehicles uh, operate on their own completely dedicated right-of-way, uh, usually on their own lanes or on their own uh, roadway uh, that's dedicated for bus rapid transit with rapid transit-like stations. So there's several notable examples, both in this area and around the country, including Hartford, Connecticut, which you can see in the lower right corner of, of the image, as well as Boston in the lower left, and other examples as well. So here's, here's an example from Albuquerque, of all places. And bus rapid transit would have stations that would be similarly situated uh, to what you would see with light rail, where they would be at street level and separated from, from the freight line. So in terms of um, the project itself, it, it brings a number of benefits to the community in, in the region. So first of all, uh, there's significant ridership demand. I showed this image a little earlier. Uh, and what it shows is that there's a significant amount of demand going both within and between boroughs. 
And the gray line depicted on the map on the right is really the, the, the alignment of, of the Interborough Express. So it could serve uh, a lot of trips, up to 88,000 uh, weekday riders, depending on the mode uh, that is chosen. Um, it would connect 17 subway lines in the Long Island Railroad, and it would provide uh, quite a number of connections to various communities, and especially it would provide a significant amount of time savings for people who need to travel between the boroughs. So as an example here, um, here we can see, in this case, a person who's traveling uh, from Flushing to Brooklyn College, and they can save almost a half hour by avoiding the circuitous trip through Manhattan. That's almost an hour savings every day, which really adds up over time. The project also supports community development and transportation equity in Queens and Brooklyn by improving access to jobs, housing, education, and recreation. As I mentioned earlier, 71% of the residents are people of color, and 33% of the residents of the corridor are below the federal poverty line. So this presents a real opportunity for many people in many communities along the line. Finally, as I mentioned previously, the corridor is an active freight line, and our goal is to maintain freight mobility for the economic and environmental health of the region, both now and in the future. To this end, the MTA is working closely with the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey as they continue their environmental review of the proposed Cross Harbor Freight Program. We at MTA are taking active steps to make sure that our designs do not preclude the future needs of freight mobility in the region, and at the same time, our colleagues at the Port Authority are taking active steps to make sure that their project does not preclude our transit options. So where does that bring us? Well, we're still in the very early stages of this as a potential transit project. We're going through right now and, and wrapping up the finer points of the feasibility study. We still need to understand more details about constraints, specific constraints along the line and the feasibility of the different transit technology and how they will fit in different locations. We intend to finalize this analysis through the summer and through your input, land on an alternative that works for the community, both operationally and one that weaves in effectively with the needs of the region. So once we, we nail down a specific alternative, then we begin an environmental review process, probably early next year, and that's, generally speaking, a, 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 a fairly involved process that involves more, um, more technical analysis, uh, more engineering, more conceptual planning, et cetera, to determine what are the impacts of this on the community and on the region. If the project is determined uh, suitable coming out of the environmental review, then we determine whether it's suitable for our capital program and if it is, and if there's funding and other resources available, we would finalize design uh, and construction and award a contract. But that, that's still a fair, a fair distance off. So with that, the next step really is we want to hear from you. Um, you. You can tell us what you think by commenting at, at the link below. And really, one of the things uh, that we want to hear about are your thoughts about where possible stations might be located, as well as which mode uh, seems to work best and why. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Sean. Great. Thank you very much, Mike. So we will now start on questions and answers. And uh, so please do continue to submit your questions. Uh, to the uh, Q&A box on the Zoom app. We'll get to as many as we can over the course of the next hour, and I'll be consolidating questions along with the project team here and posing them live. Um, the project team is also reviewing questions and will be responding to them directly uh, in the text function of the Q&A chat. Um, we also have on the Zoom a representative from the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey who will be able to respond directly to questions uh, related to the Cross Harbor Freight Project. Um, with that, let's get started. We'll start with a few questions that we received in advance. So, Mike, one of the most common questions that we get is why the project ends in Jackson Heights. There were previous iterations of the proposal that continued onward to the Bronx. What's the thinking of the current proposal? 
So, as many folks know, we're really excited about Penn Station access, which is going to bring four new stations to the Bronx uh, along Amtrak's Hellgate line, and it will bring Metro North service uh, to uh, Penn Station via the Bronx. What that does is it offers uh, transportation opportunities for residents of the Bronx for both going into Manhattan uh, as well as for going out to job opportunities and other opportunities in Westchester and, and beyond in Connecticut. Um, with that project in place, and Amtrak owns that, that line in the Bronx, uh, you have uh, two tracks that we're going to construct uh, as well as station platforms for the Metro North trains. And in addition to that, you have Amtrak's Northeast Corridor trains, which are very important, that will have passing tracks. And in addition to that, there's a freight track. So the line through the Bronx is already fully subscribed. And the trains that we will be operating on the Interborough Express, we anticipate will be operating very frequently, so they'll require two dedicated tracks. And so, uh, quite frankly, we weren't able to fit all the tracks uh, through the Bronx or up on the Hellgate Bridge uh, without a significant amount of property acquisition and so forth. That's not to say it'll never be done, but we thought it was best to start out with the things that we can accomplish potentially, which is uh, the Bay Ridge branch of the Long Island Railroad uh, and uh, quite possibly the CSX portion as well, which is, uh, seems to be very feasible at this stage. And you mentioned the, the bridge. The bridge itself is a major constraint even beyond what you have in, once you get to the Bronx. Is that right? Yes. I mean, the bridge is limited width. Uh, you can't really uh, add too much on it without uh, extreme expense. And so uh, really, uh, you know, again, we're, we're always looking for options to, to enhance the service. Um, and we thought this is the best place to start. It doesn't mean you can't go further, and there may be some creative thinking uh, that can get us past that and into the Bronx, but it requires a significant amount of resources to get there. And we get a similar question on the other end of the line. Why doesn't the proposal extend to Staten Island? So uh, the most, uh, you know, there's two ways to get to Staten Island. Well, really three. One is above the water, another is underwater, and then the third is on the water. Um, above the water, you have the Verrazano Narrows Bridge, and unfortunately, the Verrazano Narrows Bridge was not designed uh, to accommodate uh, rail transportation. Um, underwater uh, tunneling, it, it's uh, always possible, but uh, an exceptional expense. Uh, doesn't mean it's not possible in the future. And on the water, there, there may be opportunities with ferry systems and so forth. But that said, the, you know, the most severe constraint for getting uh, to Staten Island is really uh, the Verrazano Narrows Bridge itself, as well as getting uh, whatever vehicles we have from uh, the terminal uh, in Sunset Park over to, to the Narrows Bridge itself. That, that makes sense. So we'll ask a couple questions now about sort of the process by which the project will be moving forward. So I know that this is years out, and it's worth emphasizing construction would be many years out, but how will the project be constructed, and what sort of impacts do we anticipate for nearby residents? Well, I think it's too early to tell exactly what, what those impacts will be or, or the construction methods until we know what, what the chosen mode is, okay? And so that's part of what we're going through right now. We're looking uh, at uh, what the constraints are along the line, whether uh, there are unanticipated constraints that would rule out one technology or, or another. We're also, obviously, once we nail down a, a, a technology, there will be an extensive environmental review process, the federally mandated environmental review process, where you look at what the impacts are uh, of whatever proposal you are, are making. And usually that process will identify those impacts. It will identify mitigations that could uh, address any issues regarding that. Uh, it's a little too early to say what construction methods are used and so forth, uh, but we're, we're learning as we move, move ahead with this study. And, and we're also studying what sort of potential needs for property acquisition uh, would be needed, whether or not we would need to uh, extend the or expand the right-of-way uh, to include, you know, takings of private property. Yeah, you know, the, part of the reason why we're looking at an existing right-of-way 
is to minimize any external impacts there. So again, it's too early to say in the perfect world you're, you're not needing any external uh, property at all. Uh, if there is a need in isolated incidents, you, you work through uh, processes that are in place for, for addressing that. But we're, we're, part of the reason why we're looking at this specific line is to uh, mitigate to the best of our ability any need for property acquisition. We wouldn't be taking it necessarily, but you don't want to necessarily uh, have to acquire it if you can avoid that. Right. So you, you mentioned that a lot of these impacts and sort of determinations are, you know, in large part driven by which mode ends up getting chosen. Can you talk through in a little more detail what our process is over the course of, you know, I guess this year reaching what is I think called the locally preferred alternative and choosing which mode uh, we'll be advancing? Well, we went through an initial feasibility study to, to look at kind of what uh, the, 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 the constraints were for specific modes. And so we've narrowed it down to, to the three. And we work with uh, various experts from around the world who focus on this as well. And, and a lot of it comes down to uh, issues of uh, what kind of curves do you need, what kind of do, do you need to uh, do with respect to bridges, underpasses, et cetera, tunnels, and so forth. Um, and so uh, we're continuing that because we've identified a number of locations along the line where we need to look at it more closely, particularly because, again, we're trying to integ uh, uh, integrate with an existing freight line uh, we're not going to operate on the freight tracks themselves, but we need to operate alongside them or above them in a manner uh, where we can operate in, in that same corridor. And so we're going to continue that process, that technical process. And in the meantime, part of the reason why we've come to the public at this stage is we also need to hear uh, from uh, the communities about uh, what they see as the opportunities of this line as well as some of the constraints that they might identify. We also want to hear from the communities about uh, ideal locations for stations. Uh, logically, you would consider stations at major subway intersections or major arterials, but there may be things uh, that we could uh, derive some benefit from learning from the community about places where stations may or may not work well. So we're going through that entire process over the next few months, really, uh, to identify a locally preferred alternative, if you will, which would then fit into the next stage, which is environmental review. And I'll take this opportunity to plug that you can go to new.mta.info slash IBX um, to I I include comments on wh where you think stations would make sense and, and as well as which mode you think you would um, prefer. So we do have, in addition to the Q&A tonight, we do have that longer standing opportunity for folks to make their voice heard. Um, let's talk a little bit about the freight corridor. It's, it's currently an active freight corridor. Trains aren't all that frequent, but do run um, on a very regular basis. How would those existing operations be impacted? You know, we're not going to preclude freight operations. How do we do that? And what's the plan for dealing with existing quality of life issues or other challenges that um, communities face with the existing freight operations? So I, I think, you know, part of, of what we're doing is we, we have a, a, a group of, of folks uh, who are operators of various entities, transportation entities that are, are advising us, uh, and this includes the New York and Atlantic Railway, uh, who we're working with who provide that, that operation there. Um, and again, we, we take their input as well. We need to understand who their customers are, what their movements are, and so forth. And we're looking, uh, working very closely again with the Port Authority, who really takes the lead on, on understanding goods movement in, in the region, which is so important. Um, we understand that there's always quality of life concerns uh, regarding the region. The good news is uh, if this project is built, you, you need to rebuild uh, the freight tracks. Uh, for the passenger tracks to, to fit in there, and they would be built to the highest and best new standards, most modern standards, uh, at, at the point uh, if, if the project comes to fruition. And so you would expect that that would involve uh, latest in technologies to dampen noise and, and vibration. 
Um, and we know that our partners uh, in, in the freight industry are always looking at the latest uh, technologies for their, uh, for their vehicles themselves. So that's, uh, that makes a lot of sense. How, does it, how are we working specifically with the, um, with the expansion project and what does coordination with the Port Authority look like? Well, we meet with them, uh, we, we talk with the Port Authority uh, several times a week. Um, we share information, we, we share uh, what, what they learn. You know, they went through a, an environmental impact uh, study as well, uh, and they're going into their next, the next tier uh, of their work. Um, we're, we're sharing uh, our conceptual drawings, they're sharing theirs, we're identifying points uh, where we need to uh, work things through uh, in terms of making sure that we can accommodate uh, both operations. Uh, so we're, we're in regular contact with them, uh, as we are on many other projects as well. So most of the, uh, as you talked about, most of the right-of-way here is MTA, Long Island Railroad owned. There is the portion, the northern three miles of the alignment that is CSX owned, which is a freight rail operation. What is the status of our coordination with, this, with CSX and sort of how does that process work? Again, we, we've reached out to CSX. They've been participating on our steering committee. Uh, they are a, a private railroad. Uh, they own the line, so we have to understand that. And uh, we need to work with them, and we are having conversations on what, uh, what possibilities there may be and how that might look. So we're, we're continuing to work with them. What would the fare structure be? Again, I know this is early days, but it's one of the most common questions we get. So uh, fares are, are uh, within the purview of the MTA board. They, they determine kind of fare policy and, and fare structure. That said, uh, the conceptual model for this is that this would be integrated with the subway network. That, that's the whole point of this, really, is to connect people with communities. And so because it would be a subway-like service, because we now have Omni, uh, by the time this opens, we might have the next generation of whatever Omni looks like uh, in place. It will uh, make for seamless transfers uh, between subway trains these trains or buses uh, and other buses in other parts of our transportation network. So the expectation is that the fares would be similar uh, in that respect. But it's, it's too early for me to say, and, uh, but we would expect that that's probably going to be uh, the path that would be taken. And, and, you know, this is another question we get a lot. Why, you know, can you talk in a little more detail on how uh, subway operation itself was um, eliminated through the feasibility study process and sort of what the constraints are that prevent um, it being just another subway line? Sure. Um, part of uh, what we had to look at was what would fit physically in that, in that corridor. Um, and uh, subway trains have similar dimensions to, to some of the uh, commuter style cars or conventional rail cars. Uh, but subway trains tend to be longer uh, than, than the trains we'll need for this, given our, our initial ridership projections. But the, the, the chief concern is that subway trains would require a greater degree of separation from uh, the freight operation in, in the corridor than, uh, say, a conventional rail train or a commuter train. And that's by FRA standards, Federal Railroad Administration standards. And so because of that, the subway would have to be elevated, probably, above the freight line. And uh, it can't be elevated, elevated beyond street level because of uh, various concerns uh, and so forth. And, so, and, and just that the cost of construction was, was very, very high with respect to that. So uh, it was eliminated because of that. Uh, and instead, we're focusing on light rail and bus rapid transit, which can operate up to street level and still interact with the streets in a way that it is done in, in many other communities ar around the country. So it sounds like the, the fundamental um, trade-off, or, or where, where we've ended up, is that the conventional rail um, 
and actually all of these alternatives, replicate a lot of the advantages that a subway system would have while dealing with the constraints. Um, you That's know, right. It, in a way that allows us to proceed. Yeah, it primarily deals with the, the physical and operational constraints there. Um, and automated guideway transit, which is like, like the JFK air train as an example, is, is a similar, uh, similar technology that, again, would require complete separation from not just the freight, but also from, um, from, from street traffic. And so, again, that would be a lot of elevated sections, and, and the cost was, was very, very high compared to the other options. Another question that I've seen raised today is um, why we are why we think that there definitely needs to be separate tracks for our operation versus freight. I guess there's some changes in federal regulations that at least theoretically allow there to be some amount of mixing. What's our thinking in terms of needing separate tracks? So our trains would operate very frequently. As I described a little earlier, the expectation is they'd be operating every uh, 10 minutes as frequently as every five minutes perhaps. Um, and so with that level of frequency and a lot of stopping and starting and acceleration, deceleration, it's really not compatible with a, a freight track itself, which requires uh, dedication to very long trains. Uh, freight trains are, are typically very long. Uh, they operate at a much slower speed. Uh, and so really it's very, very difficult to share track. I know in, in some areas of, of the country uh, you can do that where you have very lightly used uh, operations and, and you have what's called temporal separation where you operate the freight trains late at night and operate the passenger service during the day. We see this really as a, 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 an all-day, all-night service. Uh, potentially, especially if it's connecting into the subway network. So we feel that uh, really needs to be a separate operation so that the two lines don't, don't get into conflict with one another. So uh, that makes a lot of sense. What is the thinking in terms of ADA accessibility for the, for the stations as well as the trains and buses themselves? Well, the expectation is that anything new has to be accessible has to be uh, uh, fully accessible. And so that's the expectation. The trains uh, or buses, uh, the stations themselves uh, would be accessible. So I think that fits in with the MTA's overall commitment to accessibility, and, and certainly anything we build here will be um, fully accessible. And we will work with the uh, accessibility advocacy community to make sure that it kind of meets the gold standard. Um, so that's, I, that's worth uh, saying explicitly. I want to remind folks to keep putting questions into the Q&A box. Um, we really do appreciate everyone who is attending tonight and is um, asking questions and making their voice heard at new.mta.info slash IBX, uh, where you can also put in station locations, express your preference for mode, and um, go along. Uh, give us uh, more comments uh, as we go forward. Um, so what's a, another question that has come up in a variety of different forms in advance of tonight's meeting related to the potential for bicycle or pedestrian improvements to be part of this project? There was one, uh, we got residents near East 16th Street uh, in Brooklyn in particular um, talked about the potential for a station maybe bridging over the existing right-of-way, which sort of ends in a dead end for residents nearby. I, I know we're very early, and obviously we don't have specific information about a location, but what are our thoughts in terms of the way in which this project has the ability to bridge communities and sort of provide greater bike and pedestrian access? Well, I, th I think that uh, a good example of that is really if we go back to the Bronx, one of the four stations is at Morris Park. Uh, and uh, I know we're looking at a way to bridge two sides of the railroad with, with the station itself. Uh, our station design uh, allows for uh, really the ability to connect two sides of, of uh, the line. And, and so uh, there are opportunities there. It's still too early to, to comment on specific station designs. We still have to get the station locations uh, finalized. Uh, but that said, um, the expectation is that uh, it would allow for connecting across, because by, by design, the stations would, would connect uh, both sides of the community so people could get to 
uh, get to the station and get to the line itself. As for uh, bike and, and pedestrian access, of course, all, all the modern day stations now that we're looking at, we want to be able to facilitate uh, accessibility by, by different modes as well. So we're, we're looking at that uh, also. Great, and I and I bring that I bring up the the one example that we've seen as a, a perfect example of the types of comments we're hoping to elicit. So thank you so much to everyone who has made that suggestion. Keep them coming, and you know we're very happy to, over the course of the coming months and years, uh, continue to engage on on questions like that. Don't have a definitive answer tonight, but we really appreciate the question. Um, so some more questions that have come in this evening. Um, you know, we I think a lot of folks have focused on conventional rail and light rail potentially, but bus rapid transit is also a potentially very attractive option. If it is chosen, how would we make sure that buses have the are able to operate fast and, and kind of efficiently? Would buses have the right of way at intersections? How would we avoid delays? So um, the good thing about the corridor is that uh, the number of intersections would be minimized because the buses would be operating al along a transit corridor, but there would be uh, intersections at, at major stations uh, for bus rapid transit, and it's expected that we would use the latest in technology that uh, provides for uh, signal priority uh, so that buses can move through in a timely manner. Uh, that's done successfully in quite a number of other areas of the world, and it, it can be integrated here as well. Great. Are there other, you talked about one of the advantages of bus rapid transit being sort of flexibility. How, can you expand on that a little bit more? What else would bus rapid transit bring to the table? Well, it, it's too early to talk about um, conceptual operating plans. However, uh, bus rapid transit is an inherently more flexible technology in that uh, it is conceivable that other bus lines uh, from multiple origins or multiple destinations can join onto uh, the right-of-way and, and use the right-of-way as, as a manner for uh, getting uh, between Brooklyn and Queens. So, so you have a little bit more flexibility with respect to potential routing uh, at either end of the line. Um, you also uh, have a little more flexibility with respect to if, if you just have some constraints that you get, can't get past, you can't build past uh, with a rail option, uh, the bus option still has the ability to operate like an SBS in certain locations if necessary. So you, you, you have that. You also have a little bit more flexibility with respect to um, acquiring the vehicles themselves. Uh, of course, we expect that by the time this uh, comes to fruition, the, the buses themselves would be electrically operated. Battery technology is maturing uh, as time goes on. Uh, so, so really, it, it seems like a, a, a very uh, promising technology. All, all three of these options are really very promising, and that's why we need to look more closely at, at the trade-offs, the benefits, and, and drawbacks of, of each of these uh, along the entire line. And, and just to keep on, and maybe I'll run through this for each of the modes, the, on bus rapid transit, the disadvantages might be um, it had the lowest projected ridership. Uh, what, was, what drove that in the projections that we have so far? Really, it's the size of the vehicles that, that are the constraining factor there. So, so uh, a light rail vehicle is a much longer vehicle. Uh, it has a significantly larger capacity, sometimes two. Uh, th uh, sometimes three or, or four times the size of a bus in terms of capacity. Uh, the vehicles themselves are very configurable. You can you can uh, couple several uh, several light rail vehicles together and, and get a much longer train. Uh, so that if the demand uh, warrants uh, for special events or or for certain things or just if, if you're seeing uh, less demand, you can. Uh, have have a smaller train, so you have a significant amount of flexibility there uh, with the light rail vehicle, and and you have very similar flexibility to that with the conventional rail as 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 well. With buses, you're a little more constrained. Uh, you have uh, a specific sized vehicle, uh, and um, there may be um, 
there may be developments in what they call platooning technology, which allows buses to uh, kind of virtually connect to one another. Uh, we're still looking at that to see if that technology matures. Similar question then for light rail. Can you talk through, you, you got into some of its advantages in that answer. What are some of the drawbacks that we would have to reckon with uh, if advancing a light rail project? Well, I, I, I think, you know, probably uh, the most significant drawbacks would be, again, um, you, you have, uh, you're dealing with rail, so uh, you're dealing with uh, significant engineering constraints along certain parts of the line. Uh, you're limited uh, to grades uh, that where you're climbing or, or descending. Uh, you're also uh, operating light rail typically through overhead catenary or trolley wire. Yes, light rail trains can operate for small segments on battery, uh, but also that requires different systems that need to be put in place, particularly power distribution systems uh, as well. And uh, for, for all of these, uh, we're still looking at potential locations uh, for servicing facilities. Uh, and they each have unique requirements uh, related to that. And it's presumably a similar answer in terms of what the um, challenges that would need to be overcome with conventional rail are. Yes, I think so. I, you know, conventional rail also has uh, even more stringent constraints with respect to uh, gradient, uh, with respect to uh, curvature, uh, you know, kind of minimum radius and so forth. So they're not quite as flexible in terms of weaving the tracks in and out of tight places as light rail might be. Uh, the other thing is, is on bus rapid transit requires a little bit more width uh, for buses and for bus lanes. Uh, light rail is, is a little more flexible in, in that respect uh, than, than, um, than uh, bus rapid transit or, or commuter rail. Gotcha. So that is, that is exactly the sort of engineering and sort of planning puzzle we're going to be working through over the course of this year and exactly the sort of thing that we need more um, public input to help us also determine the ways in which it will influence everyday riders' um, ability to take advantage of it. So those are the, that's sort of the next step is to reach uh, that conclusion. There's a lot, a little further down uh, the timeline though, we have questions about how the project will be funded and what, you know, when we think we could potentially enter construction. Well, it, it, it's a little early to say. Um, I think we're, we're looking at uh, this in the context of the MTA capital plan. So we have an MTA capital planning process. We're undertaking a 20-year needs study right now. Uh, that 20-year needs study is, is due in September of 2023, and clearly this is going to be uh, one of many projects that we look at in a comparative way to determine whether it, it it's, uh, really warrants a, a closer look at, at what those opportunities are. Ultimately, funding comes down to a combination of, of federal, state, and regional uh, sources typically, and, and uh, it, it's a little too early to say how those sources might be combined uh, to help support that. In terms of time frames for construction, uh, it's a little out of my wheelhouse to estimate how long these things take, um, and uh, suffice it to say that uh, the environmental review process is typically a two-year process, and so that we would see being undertaken starting uh, early next year. Beyond that, you get into the design uh, and the construction, and sometimes design and construction is tied together uh, to uh, warrant more efficiencies. Uh, so it's a little too early to say what, the, what that looks like. It, it's definitely, you're, you're not going to be seeing the trains and buses rolling in the next year or two, that's for sure. It's, it's going to take several years to get down the path. Maybe it's worth, because I know this is another area of expertise for you, for you to talk through what the timeline process looked like for the Penn Station Access Project, which has some similarities in terms of using an existing right-of-way, um, but, you know, also had a many-year journey towards um, construction, which is beginning this year. Well, um, I can say that the planning process for Penn Access took about 10 years to get to this point. It actually took longer than 10 years, um, and that 
involved the, the environmental process. It involved initial design and construction. It involved significant uh, collaboration and negotiation with Amtrak, the owner uh, of the line, and it's complex. It, it involved a, a lot of work uh, with Metro North, with Long Island Railroad, uh, New Jersey Transit, everybody at, at Penn Station as well. Uh, so uh, this would also be a complex project. It, it's hard to kind of compare these uh, uh, across, but suffice it to say, again, it, it's a complex process that you, you work through to get to your goal of greater mobility for the region. Great, and I, and I appreciate you uh, talking that through. I, I want to be clear, we're not saying 10 years is what we expect here. Uh, certainly the governor's interest has um, accelerated this process and we are excited to be getting into really substantive details now, but it's I think a really good context to understand just how complex some of these planning and engineering questions can be. Um, Another question about the route that comes up frequently is uh, whether this project could go to LaGuardia Airport. Does it connect with some of the other studies being undertaken also by the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey um, regarding uh, better public transit access to LaGuardia? So we, we know our partners and we're working with our partners at the Port Authority uh, as they evaluate various options for enhancing access to, to LaGuardia. Um, and they have uh, a number of options that they're considering. I don't want to get in, in their way. Uh, they have their own process and, and their own materials that are publicly available that describe the options uh, that they're looking into. Suffice it to say that there, there's a couple of places where uh, there may be uh, opportunities for people to transfer between the two projects um, and I think really it's too early to say I think we have to let uh, their study take its course uh, we are aware of of the options that they're looking at in their study they are aware of the Interborough Express and the opportunities that it provides uh, and we're working closely together suffice it to say though the objective of the Interborough Express itself is to connect uh, Jackson Heights uh, along that arc and, and along that specific right of way that we're studying, uh, which is the Bay Ridge branch uh, of Long Island Railroad and, uh, if possible, the Fremont secondary of CSX. Has there been any thinking of phasing the project or kind of fighting it off in smaller chunks so that we're able to move more quickly? I think it, it's conceivable. Again, that's one of the things that we're going to learn more about uh, as we move forward, uh, understanding what the constraints are, uh, because it will become clearer uh, where, for example, uh, you have the maintenance and storage facility that that's uh, oftentimes a point where, where that would need to be in the first phase. Um, and then as you look at opportunities as they build beyond there, uh, I think you just you just look and, and see. So it, it, it's possible, but right now we're looking at the project as a whole uh, at the moment to determine what what is achievable and what's achievable in a timely manner too. This gets to uh, the other constraint: if time is one, money's the other. How much do we have an estimate on how much we think the project will cost? And I think it's too early to tell at this point. Um, I, I think it's, it, it is in the billions of dollars, uh, we can say that, uh, but we'll have a much better idea of what the project costs will be uh, when we get towards the end of this phase of the study and determine a, a, a preferred alternative. And once we have that alternative and understand the specific engineering constraints and understand the unknowns, then we'll have a much greater resolution and understanding of what the cost would be. So how are we, you know, we've talked a lot about the coordination with the Port Authority um, regarding their Cross Harbor Rail project as well as you just mentioned the LaGuardia uh, link study. Can you tell us a little bit more about what our coordination looks like with other agencies, whether it's city agencies like DOT, you know, other state agency partners, who else are we working with and how else are we kind of working with our government partners? So we're working with various agencies of both the state and the city. Um, our, our partners in planning and partners uh, in departments of transportation, partners in the development groups of the state and the city uh, are all uh, meeting with us. 
Uh, they're trying to understand more about uh, our corridor, about the levels of service uh, as they consider uh, their projects, as they consider the future of the region. Uh, so we have regular meetings with uh, the various agencies uh, throughout government, really. And, and I have to say the government agencies have been very, very supportive uh, as well as we've moved through this. In terms of coordination within or, or potential synergy within the MTA family, um, would, would any of the rail options be interoperable with Metro North or Long Island Railroad trains? Well, it, it's a, a very different style of product, if you will, for the customer. So uh, the intent of this line is really a circulatory system. So I these trains would operate very frequently, again, every five to ten minutes, more like a subway line. Uh, and they're designed to start and stop very frequently. So conventional rail is the only one of the three options that by definition could operate uh, with uh, commuter rail. However, the commuter rail trains are designed and, and scheduled and, and structured to be high speed lines, uh, longer distances and so forth. So uh, there will be uh, economies of scale certainly with respect to uh, maintaining uh, the equipment and, and other approaches there. Um, but it, it's not designed to be tied right in uh, because, for example, uh, Penn Station and Grand Central, uh, where we, we are seeing new, new service uh, very soon for Long Island, uh, are already uh, fully subscribed with respect to uh, the slots available into those stations and the signaling systems and the timing uh, of those trains. Got it. Although there would be, and that, that all makes sense, there would be a connection potentially uh, to Long Island Railroad, uh, perhaps at East New York. Is that the case? Uh, that, that's the expectation right now, it really, is to, to situate a station there uh, and facilitate transfer uh, as well. Um, yep. Got it. So there would be potential transfer, but not necessarily interoperability is the planning today. Um, a, a similar question, and I suspect with a... Or, or with an answer that is probably that we don't quite know yet, but a question that's come in is whether we know whether it's conventional rail or really any of the op these options, um, which operating agency, whether it's New York City Transit, Long Island Railroad in the case of conventional rail, do we have any idea in terms of who would be operating the service? I, I think it's still too early to tell at this stage. So that is one uh, where folks can stay tuned um, as we get further along the process. Um, so, you know, as we approach the, you know, not quite the tail end, but as we're, we're getting towards the end of the process, I want to encourage folks to continue putting questions in the Q&A box, as well as visiting new.mta.info slash IBX for more information um, and, and kind of the ability to put more comments in. Um, one question that uh, folks have is how can they stay involved? What are the ways in which they'll be able to continue to uh, make their voice heard beyond tonight's meeting? Well, Sean, I think you can answer that, right? What's the website again? Well, it's new.mta.info slash IBX. There's also a link to that in the Q&A that folks should be able to see. Um, so, yeah, we will be posting uh, our future meetings on that website. We will also be, again, very eager to review comments that are coming in through the comment form there, um, station locations, mode preference, as well as more specific kind of local issues that folks want to raise and put on the table. Um, you know, we also do anticipate another round of outreach later this year. You know, I think our goal for this meeting was to set the stage, make sure that folks understood the basics of where we're at today at this early part of the project. Um, we're going to sort of, you know, uh, uh, start to focus on advancing some of these engineering constraining, constraint exploration and some of the other things that Mike has mentioned today, and then come back out, um, you know, and have more uh, conversations, more detailed conversations with folks uh, later this year. So definitely stay tuned on that website. Definitely put your information in now so that we will know, um, you know, what you're thinking and be able to keep you in the loop as we move forward here. Um, 
So a, a more specific question that's come in relates to the East New York Tunnel. So you showed the image of it in your presentation. Uh, it's the still existing tunnel from, I guess, from the 1870s is when it dates back to. Will we be able to reuse that, or does it need to be rebuilt? So we've been inspecting the tunnel, uh, and the early inspections look very promising right now. So, so the expectation would be that we would uh, hopefully uh, be able to reuse the tunnel, uh, and uh, there would still be room for, for the freight service as well in the, in the existing tunnel. And it would need to be, you know, obviously brought up to, to uh, proper operational standards. That makes sense. I, I know that in that tunnel and perhaps along the corridor, there's also a pipeline that runs. Um, any information you can give about sort of what the, you know, how we're planning around the, I think it's the Buckeye I th pipeline? I think we're, we're working through uh, all the constraints really along the line. So we'll, we'll see. Uh, we're very mindful of, of where the opportunities are for uh, design uh, to support the infrastructure that we're, we're coming across. Whether, and that could also be other, other types of utilities as well uh, that we cross along the line. But it's, it's too early to get into very specific stuff about that. That makes sense. Certainly, like any project we do, kind of dealing with and working with the utilities is a really critical part of it. So this project is no different in that sense. Um, we're also still in the process of sort of identifying potential locations for maintenance and other storage facilities, the other sort of ancillary facilities that go along with this. That's part of the review we're doing? Yes. Okay, that, that one was sort of an easy <laughs> one, but um, I, I think we've, we've got to... Yeah. Um, so can you talk a little bit more about what this... You know, you're a planner by trade. Um, can you talk a little bit more about what this project represents in terms of... Um, the MTA's thinking of the future of transit. You know, I think there's a lot of sense that with the, um, you know, with the pandemic that travel patterns have changed, that there are, you know, more people taking advantage of hybrid work and not necessarily uh, perhaps accelerating some of those trends where you have more trips that are, um, you have more trips that are kind of within the outer boroughs rather than going into Manhattan. As a sort of planner and as a former, as a recovering academic, you know, what are, you, what are your thoughts on sort of the big picture um, and what this project uh, relates to, you know, the future of travel in New York City? So as we think about the future of the region, we, we look at uh, issues such as resiliency, equity, uh, capacity, uh, mobility, things like that. And, and we're really going to look at a variety of projects in a comparative way to understand uh, how they perform uh, for, for the region. Uh, one of the things that captured our attention with respect to this project, particularly in the post-pandemic world, is uh, there is, uh, there and, and has continued to be an emphasis on intra and interborough travel. Uh, and intra-regional travel, really, even if you get out into the suburbs. So a lot of people aren't necessarily going to the central business districts. They're, they are, and central business districts will always be an important part of our region, and that travel is still, by and large, a, a very significant portion. But there's also an increasing emphasis on mobility, and it's mobility not just to go uh, to and from a job that it defined hours. It's really mobility to uh, be able to get to uh, other things you need to get to, whether it's shopping, whether it's uh, doctor's appointments or, or other reasons, the many reasons that people need to travel. And so I think what, what the Interborough Express does is it offers the opportunity to really leverage existing right-of-way to facilitate that type of trip that's taken by people who might not have the ability to remotely work, uh, but it gives them more options to get to their destinations, and their destinations are oftentimes more highly dispersed throughout the boroughs and throughout the region than just in uh, the central business districts of Manhattan. So that's one of the reasons why, why this looks very promising, even in the post-pandemic world. Can you talk a little bit, you've mentioned a couple of times this comparative evaluation process and its 20-year uh, needs, the 20-year needs assessment that it is um, kind of slotting into. Can you talk a little bit more about 
you know, how that process is going to work. And I guess the question that people have is, is this project competing against, um, you know, their other favorite projects? Is it is it going to get in the way of other, um, you know, critical investments that the MTA needs to make? How are we balancing that? So first of all, state of good repair is key. It's the prime objective of MTA's capital program. We need to make sure that our existing system works effectively. Uh, normal replacement uh, of technologies is very important of components. Uh, making our stations accessible is also a key priority of, of MTA. As we look beyond state of good repair, accessibility, uh, and normal replacement, then we get into the realm of what is necessary for the region. And so one of the things we'll be doing is looking at this and a variety of other projects, and this one was promising, so promising that it, it certainly garnered a lot of attention for a lot of good reasons. And we look at these based on, of course, the ridership that they would generate, uh, based on their relative costs to one another, uh, based on uh, equity uh, matters, uh, resiliency, and so forth. And so we'll look at this uh, through that light. And, and we have every reason to believe that this project is a very strong performer in that respect, which is why we are, are following uh, along the lead of, of our governor and, and as well as many others in the region uh, who have been championing this uh, in looking at uh, what is the path forward for this project. Um, and the path forward, uh, we're, we're looking at how, if that works effectively, then how can it be done in, in, in as expeditious and as uh, cost-effective manner as possible? I think that's uh, spoken like a, like a great planner and, and really appreciate that. I think it is, it's worth emphasizing the current capital program has over 80% of its funding for state of good repair, normal replacement, accessibility, not new expansion. So it's, it's an important piece of this, but it's, you know, the, one of the great promises of this project is the way in which it um, connects to, you know, up to 17 subway lines. Um, you need those subway lines to be running well in order for that to be a valuable investment to connect to them. So, um, yeah, I think that that context is really important here. Um, in terms of uh, another question we got tonight is that the IBX and the G train, you know, both go from Brooklyn to Queens and back, and, and they end up in similar endpoints. Um, so, how would this project relate to the G train? Um, you know, someone's uh, I don't. I don't think there's any fear that the G train will be discontinued, but how does it relate to it? Well, they serve very different purposes. You know, they, they serve different geographies between the origin and destination points, and there's many other lines and opportunities to travel between the two boroughs as well. Uh, I think what it comes down to is, is you look at the communities, the specific communities that this links up, right? So it's not just about connecting to the to the subways, it's also about linking various communities. And so a simple look at the map and you see that they serve very different geographies. Uh, and it, it, it's another opportunity for the region to facilitate mobility. That's what we want to do, is, is facilitate the mobility of, of the region. We're coming up on 10 minutes left in tonight's program, so I want to put in one more plug for folks to put their questions into the Q&A box. Um, sort of a last uh, last call for questions for consideration tonight. And again, you can go to new.mta.info slash IBX in order to put in questions that we will continue to engage with and, and, and kind of take into account going forward. It's, it's worth noting that we're, we're getting so many questions that um, we might not be able to answer them all tonight. There's some that I won't be able to answer, certainly. Um, so we'll, we'll be able to get to those as, as time goes on. But, but we, are, uh, we are collecting those, and we'll, we'll have that on the website. Absolutely. Shortly after this program, um, we will be putting up a frequently asked questions uh, document on the project site, which will have a lot of the information we've talked about tonight and more, uh, sort of in written form and translated in several languages. Um, so that's a really exciting resource, and we're going to keep adding to that over the course of this project and as more questions come in. So yeah, we're, we're not going to get to everything, but sort of last call to put something in for consideration tonight and we'll continue to, um, you know, be responding to these questions in the future.
So, Sean, one of the things I'm seeing on our monitor is, is a lot of questions about station locations. And quite frankly, the answer is we want to hear from you about where there are viable station locations out there. We don't want to get too prescriptive about that at this point. Uh, so we're, we're looking forward to getting more input. And as we get towards the end of this process, uh, particularly uh, towards the end of summer when we're getting to the locally preferred alternative, we'll have a much better idea. The obvious candidates are intersections with subway lines and, and major arterials. Uh, and you can just look at a map and, and, and uh, figure that out. Out. But that said, there may be some of those that work better or less well than others. And so that's where we're going to be getting back to you on, on station location. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. To, to shout out a couple of suggestions we've had. Folks have asked about Utica Avenue. Folks have asked about Broadway Junction. There are others that have come in. So uh, thank you for suggesting those. And be sure to note them on the project website as well if you have an opportunity. Um, so we, you mentioned a few, another question that's come in is, you know, we've, we've talked about a few different uh, international and, and national, but international um, comparisons that are similar to the different modes that we've talked about here. What additional sort of outreach are we going to do to, or have we done to the, you know, our peer agencies that operate similar services? You know, there's sort of a unique opportunity here to add a connecting line on the, you know, sort of a, a on the um, circumference of uh, the existing system. You know, are we going to be looking at international best practices, both in terms of the, you know, sort of construction as well as planning for this line? We certainly do. Um, London Overground, I mentioned earlier, uh, as a great example of where uh, an older rail line was repurposed uh, for more of a transit-like purpose. Uh, and we're, we're members of, of various uh, groups, uh, both informal and formal, of, of transit agencies around the world. Uh, in this day and age, we get together through the Internet. We have virtual meetings and so forth, uh, and we share best practices. Uh, and uh, there, there's a lot of look at a lot of places uh, in different cities, different places uh, that have similar operations, that have similar uh, challenges uh, and that have similar opportunities perhaps with other pieces of infrastructure that could be uh, better leveraged uh, accordingly. So we, we're, we're continuing to do that. We continue to learn from our colleagues uh, in different uh, transit properties and we also learn from our colleagues uh, in other agencies, both governmental and non-governmental agencies as well. Uh, I should point out the Regional Plan Association uh, had highlighted uh, this project quite a number of years ago. Um, and uh, really, uh, it's come up through the years in, in different, in different uh, forms and different factors. Um, and again, it, it's uh, talking with our colleagues, both in the academic world, both in the nonprofit world, and so forth, is very important because that's, that's the way we keep the ideas moving. So we'll do, I almost made it through the whole night without uh, a microphone gaffe, but so we're, uh, we're coming near the end here. Let's get to a, a couple final questions. <laughs> One that has come up a lot tonight is sort of what is the, how are we going to connect into the existing subway network? Um, you know, we, we, we mentioned that we intend to have uh, transfers. What can we say at this early stage about um, what the, at least planning looks like to make sure that this project effectively connects to the existing subway lines? Well, I, I think that's the whole point of the project is to connect the subway lines, right? I mean, you know, that, that's part of it, and to connect the communities to the subway lines as well. So um, I think we're, we're moving towards a fair technology that will enable you to do that, right? And, and so, again, it's a few years off. It might not be 10 years. It might be sooner. Hopefully it's sooner, right? You know, but it's a few years off still. And as the fair technologies mature, uh, our ability to enable people to connect uh, either directly from platform to platform 
or uh, you might need to connect in other ways, you will still have proximity uh, to the legacy subway lines as well as key bus lines and have the ability to make those connections. And really a lot of it comes down to the new fare technologies that we're seeing uh, become more mature uh, as, as time goes on. And that, uh, namely, Omni. Just, just, just to say its, say its name. Uh, which yeah, I think is nice. Yes. Yes. Um, so we, we really are sort of reaching the end of the evening. And, and again, I really am grateful for everyone who's, who's um, tuned in here. Let me end on sort of a, a broader, um, we've, we've asked this question in a couple different ways, but, um, you know, can you run through one last time sort of what the process looks like over the course of um, this year, over the course of the next maybe two to three years in the life of this project? So as we move through the upcoming summer, we're going to uh, do a, a fair amount of uh, work to determine uh, what the constraints are for the various modes uh, from a physical perspective. We also need to hear from the public uh, about what works uh, from a community context perspective. We want uh, whatever is chosen to be contextually sensitive to the communities that we would be serving. Um, we, and that gets down to things like station location and so forth. Um, so from that, we will have, uh, hopefully, by the end of the year, a preferred alternative uh, in terms of mode, uh, specific station locations that will give us a better idea uh, with respect to the constraints as well of uh, costs involved. Uh, we'll be rerunning our ridership models. We continue to do that, understanding uh, various scenarios looking forward. And then that will all feed into the environmental review process. Uh, the environmental review process, we expect, will get started early next year. With the inputs of, of this information, we're continually planning and, and not just doing the planning, but we're doing the preliminary work regarding uh, engineering feasibility and so forth to, to feed into that process. And then we would have uh, the environmental review process, uh, which is a federal process. Um, and uh, in addition to that, uh, there's other processes uh, that you would uh, undertake as well. Um, and that would all then feed into uh, the next phase, which would be how it would fit within uh, the, the larger landscape of the MTA capital program, understanding again that state of good repair, normal replacement is key, but determining how this might fit in with other uh, potential expansion projects. Uh, and then from that, uh, of course, the, the availability of funds is also key. Uh, I don't want to make light of that. that. That's a very important key. Uh, and that would determine things uh, that would relate to uh, how long it would take to, to bring this to fruition. There's also uh, interaction uh, with the Port Authority as they bring their study uh, for cross-harbor freight opportunities uh, to fruition, uh, as well as interaction, of course, with uh, the freight operators uh, in, in the area, particularly CSX. So that is, I think, a very comprehensive look ahead. Again, we are, it is really exciting to be involved in this project at, these ver at this very early stage. You know, we have an incredible amount of excitement. The governor guaranteed that with her uh, enthusiasm and support. And I think we are, we here at the MTA are very excited to pursue this project you know, mindful of and, and navigating within all the different constraints and all the different, you know, processes that we're going to need to go through to, as you say, situate it properly in the context of our investments. But it is a very exciting time uh, and a very exciting project to be working on um, here at the MTA. So I'll, I'll take one final opportunity to remind folks to go to new.mta.info slash IBX to put additional comments in and view our frequently asked questions as we upload those in the aftermath of this meeting. Um, I also want to take an opportunity to help us, ask folks to help us improve these events by filling out a brief survey. The link for that um, should exist in the chat um, and as well as, and actually maybe if you 
think you've, if you advance the slide, yes, here we have, um, it's a voluntary survey, but if you have an opportunity, you can scan the QR code on your screen or go to the link or, that's in the chat or listed there. That will give us um, an opportunity to help us, you know, do a better job uh, and, and reach people even more effectively. So with that, I, I think we are at time. I want to thank you, Mike, for your expertise, for your openness to these questions. I know we're at very early days, but I think folks are very excited, and that, that's, that determined a lot of the questions that we, that we ran through tonight. Thank you, Sean, and thank everybody out there. It's really an honor and a privilege to be able to work on these projects. It, it's really exciting uh, to see the energy and the opportunity uh, for the region, particularly with respect to the ability to enhance mobility uh, for the entire region. So thank you uh, for the privilege of being here. Thank you. So yeah, I, let me echo those thanks to everyone uh, who tuned in tonight. Let me also thank the team here at the MTA who made this uh, event possible, both on the IT side, on the tech side, and as well as the project team who have been sorting through questions and will do a heck of a lot of follow-up to make sure that we um, are taking into account everyone's comments tonight. So. Thank you, everyone, for your attention, for your interest. I, I lied when I said it was my last time. Let me say one more time. Go to new.mta.info slash IBX um, and give a, you know, stay engaged with us as this project continues in the weeks, months, and years to come. Thank you very much. Good evening.